Hello there guys and welcome back to my channel for a very, very special video just before Christmas because we are joined by a very special guest, of course, again by CFC Pice, who has again managed to sort ourselves the crazy guests. In the summer we had Simon Johnson on, here we are now set by the Athletics' very own Liam Toomey. First of all, Liam, thank you for joining us as, you know, obviously, because, you know, we need to be appreciative when you do give us your time. Um First of all, how you been? How you been? It's been a stressful period for, you know, you sports journalists, especially now in this Christmas period and now with everything going on in the UK. How you been? Well, it's been a bit funny for me because I've been on paternity leave since September. Um, so I, I, I've kind of been watching it from one step removed. Um, it's the first time I've been doing that with Chelsea since, um, well, 2015, when it was all unravelling for Mourinho. Uh, that I was sort of, I was in between jobs at that point. So this is the first time that I've not in a few years that I've not been proactively writing about Chelsea every few days. And it, I've still been doing our podcast straight up, straight out of Cobham uh, once a week. So I've, I've kind of kept my eye in and obviously I've, I didn't watch the Wolves game, but I've been watching all the other games recently. Um, so it, it's actually been quite nice not to have to write and just to kind of try and get a, a bit of a broader perspective. Cause sometimes you can be, you can be so um, yeah, sort of flat out, trying to put pieces together that you don't always take in certain things and you you sometimes get a little bit too much tunnel vision on what you're working on. So it's quite good to get a, take a step back and try and see the broader picture of what's happening at Chelsea. Oh, for sure. But let's hope it's not unravelling the same way as it did for Mourinho. Let's hope it's not well, doing yeah. the same thing now. <laughs> that would be good. But is it is it very different for you when you obviously usually tend to go to games to write about them? And now you follow them on TV. Do you get a very different perspective also as a journalist? Yeah, I mean, there's also an added layer of um, COVID games versus non-COVID games. I mean, the it, you know, aside from the, from the pandemic, sort of pre-pandemic, going to games had much, much more value for us than watching on TV. Um, just because, unfortunately, when you're watching on TV, as slick as the kind of production values are, um, and and like the the cameras and everything, you only see what the camera is showing you at any given point in time. Whereas when you're at a stadium in the press box, particularly the Stanford Bridge press box, which is a few rows behind the dugouts, you get such a fantastic view of what the managers are doing, what's going on with the subs, um, you know, any sort of color that you might be working on in terms of you know what Tuchel might be saying at any point in time how he reacts to certain big points in the game you just don't really get that off tv unless you're lucky yeah. enough for the camera to switch to him at that point in time um so that's just one example of the value you get going to games and usually pre-covid um you know we would get a lot of in-person post-match as well in-person press conferences in-person mix zones we haven't had that in a long time it was just starting to come back and now Omicron has, has taken over the UK like it has everywhere else. And I think uh, Chelsea have gone back to Zoom press conferences. I think most clubs are doing the same. It's the sensible thing. But it's, yeah, it is what it is. But it's um, it, it's kind of frustrating from a professional standpoint. Uh, sure. I, I don't mind point watching point. games on TV as long as they're on TV. I hate, yeah. I, I really hate the 3 p.m. blackout now because I, I didn't have to deal with it that much as um because I'd usually be at the games. But what trying to watch on streams is awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it really is. Does, does it change much for you whether you are part of the press conferences via Zoom or whether it's in person? Does it like, or if it does change a lot, what, how, how does it really change? Because obviously you still see the manager kind of with his, you know, how he's acting and stuff, because you can still see the camera. But I presume it's still different when you don't see them in person. There's, I remember the whole Conte thing a few years ago when he was like, you know, asking for a piece of cake from the journalist or whatever. Like, obviously, those things can't happen with Zoom, can they? Yeah, you lose a lot of things, big and small, um, from these press conferences when they're not in person. I mean, the the first most obvious thing is that you can't ask a follow up question if you've been muted. So, <laughs> if you're all in the same room, um, and and you've asked a question that you feel like the manager's response is not even necessarily that they haven't properly answered your question. It's that their answer, there's something interesting in there you want to maybe explore more further. Yeah. You would have the, ch the chance to do that in person much more easily because you could kind of just pipe up immediately and, and, and see if you could continue the, the interaction, the way Chelsea organize it. And I understand the way, why they do it because there has to be some sort of system. It's very difficult to coordinate these things on zoom. Um, but as soon as you ask your question, you're muted. 
and then that's pretty much it so it, it has become one question per journalist per organization and you have to try and you have to try and make sure your question's a good one and you, you i think you probably see now more journalists trying to wrap maybe two or three questions into one yeah. question because they're trying to get um they're trying to get as much out of the manager as possible from their perspective but the, i find that rarely works as a journalist it, certain managers are okay with it they'll remember everything you've asked them other people will just answer the last thing you've said so the first question or two will get lost in that situation but they, yeah and the other thing is just being in the room with a manager yeah you get a little bit of the body language when they're on screen um but you do get more of a sense of what their mood is like um you know what they're like before the cameras start rolling afterwards you know they usually switch the cameras off for the newspaper sections but we would stay in there and just kind of sit in um and you just get much more of a sense of of how they're feeling and what the si what the situation is around the club um so yeah we've lost a lot with with stuff being put on zoom and hopefully it's not a permanent thing no, there you go. Before we just move into what we actually have planned to talk about, just one follow-up question about, about the, the press conferences, I guess, because especially when you're so limited to one question, what if the guy before you asks a question that you just wanted to ask? Like, how many do you have prepared in a way? And how annoyed are you if your main question all of a sudden is asked by somebody else? Because obviously you can still use those quotes, essentially, because he still said them. But it's like maybe the, the question was essentially the same, but worded slightly differently. So there's particularly one detail that you were trying to look out for and now it's gone because it's pointless to ask the very same question again, essentially. Like, how does that work for you? Yeah, the, the, the rookie move is to go in with one question in your head. The the pro move is to go in with two or three and have a couple of backups because it can that exact situation can happen and has happened to me before. Um, if it's a Zoom situation and someone just before me Ask, ask the question I want to ask or touches on the topic I want to ask. I don't really care as long as the manager gets asked it. Um, and as long as the, the, the only time it can be, you know, slightly frustrating is maybe when you think you would have worded a question slightly differently to get a, a slightly more open response. But generally speaking, you know, we're all professional journalists. We don't, we don't tend to ask closed questions. Which, so it's very rare that I, I've thought, oh, I could have asked that question a lot better. You know, it's it, it, it's usually fine. If someone takes your question, you've just got to make sure when it comes around to you next that you've got yeah, something right. worth worthwhile to go to because you can't just go, uh, what's your favourite colour? Um, or you know, something <laughs> yeah. like that. Uh, no, exactly. Yeah, well, you'll go, because you'll, you'll go viral, but in a bad way. For sure. No, exactly. That, that That's half the problem, honestly. Um, but Pais, why don't you take us into what we had actually planned to talk about? Because obviously today was all like on the weekend, especially for Chelsea, like, oh, how many COVID cases can you have to still play and blah, blah, blah. And now there was this big grand Premier League meeting where, well, at least I was expecting games for at least for a couple of weeks to be probably stopped with, you know, obviously... COVID going crazy within Premier League clubs in, in particular, obviously in the UK in general, but um, within Premier League clubs, it's kind of like it's, it's COVID has been going crazy in England for a while, but it's never been this much within Premier League clubs, um, which is kind of the weird thing. But Pais, um, what exactly came out today and how, how shall we, I don't know, let's find out what Liam thinks about it, I guess, and maybe he knows more than, than we've been publicly informed, I suppose. Yeah, Liam, just basically wanted to ask you your thoughts on the whole situation because um, obviously, it looks like things are going to continue. From what I've seen, it's like supposedly if you've got enough to fill the squad, you're going to have to play. And if not, call up the under 21s, is what I was reading, I think, from Henry Winter earlier, um, who's a good journalist. So, Liam, like, what's your whole thoughts on the game supposedly continuing now that they've decided that? You know, do you think it will be a downer for Chelsea based on the current situation? I mean, personally, I think it's going to be a really good thing for like teams like Man City, obviously, because their depth is just outrageous. But with the current cases at Chelsea and 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 Brentford, especially, we've got them on Wednesday, right? So, what what do you think is going to happen? Like, what are your whole thoughts on the whole situation? Well, I, th I think the, my my main takeaway from today's news that you know the Premier League's decided to go on for now is that the clubs had an opportunity to to band together and stop this if they wanted to but it, by by all accounts it didn't even get to a vote um i'm sure if they wanted a vote they would have got one and if there had been enough of an appetite across all the clubs to call off the games for now um then they would have done it and i think it's a combination of factors i think one is um there's not necessarily 
a hugely compelling case for, you know, if we have a two week circuit breaker, will that actually help that much? You know, is Omicron likely to be, you know, less prevalent or, you know, rising? Are infections going to be rising any less sharply in two weeks than they are right now? We don't know. We're all living kind of a day at a time at the moment. So there's you could you could have a two week break and there's no guarantee that the clubs could come back um, in any better shape, especially when you're talking about the Christmas period. And, you know, if you send players away, what are they going to do? They're going to mingle with their families and, you know, they're going to have probably lots of lots of close contacts indoors. So you might actually come back in two weeks and have more cases and be in a worse position than you're in now, unless you're sending these guys away to be in bubbles and like self-isolate, even if they're negative, which I'm sure no one wants to do over Christmas anyway. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's, that's a complicated thing. There's no guarantee that a circuit breaker would actually work. And the other part of this is we can't underestimate just how lucrative the festive football schedule is to the Premier League and all the clubs. There is a, a ton of money on the line for everyone here. It's not it's not a small thing to to say we're gonna we're gonna call off the uh, the Boxing Day games and you know the the twenty eighth and the and the new the games around New Year's. These are huge money spinners for the Premier League because a lot of the other European leagues aren't running. We know the Premier League's the most watched league in the world, but particularly at this time, it's the only show in town if you want to watch football. Um, so the, the you know you can you can bet your your bottom dollar that um you know broadcasters would have made it very clear that they would want these fixtures to be fulfilled where possible because they this is where the bulk of their investment you know is returned in these sorts of games because everyone's off work and people want to watch football um so i i, I think that you know c- calling off these two weeks probably would have had significant financial ramifications with broadcasters as well um, and so there, there's a lot, there are a lot of moving pieces to a conversation like this. So I, I can kind of understand why they've decided to, to go, well, look, we'll just try and battle through as best we can. And they know it's not going to be fair for the integrity of the competition because there's no such thing really as a level playing field. COVID doesn't discriminate. Um, it will hit certain clubs harder than others and there's no telling which ones. Um, and, and, and we'll just have to deal with it. Everyone will have to deal with it. Um, as for the Chelsea perspective, my impression of the last couple of weeks is kind of this this has shown up um, that Chelsea squad, while theoretically one of the deepest in Europe, practically isn't as deep as a lot of people would like to think it is, um, at least in terms of players that can come in and play Tuchel's system to a high level. You know, one, once you start getting into players like Ross Barkley, Malang Sarr, um, Sal Niguez, of course. I know apparently, by all accounts he played better against Wolves um, and hopefully that's a sign that you know he's getting up to speed with English football. But at the moment, it looks like once you get past the sort of 13, 14 players that are the, the real core, the sort of the core that won the Champions League for Chelsea last season, the, you get down into players that while they're still internationals, while they're still high-profile players, um, they're not able to perform at the same level in this Tuchel system and ensure that Chelsea don't miss a beat in terms of results. And, um, you know, I think, Pice, you probably make a good point. I think City are probably in a better position because they have two really high-quality players um, and high-quality sort of Guardiola players that could just slot into certain positions and, and keep the machine moving. Um, and Liverpool don't really have as much depth, but they they just seem to be a, a prolific scoring machine. Uh, I know they had a bit of a slip up against against Tottenham, but um, they they continue to massively impress me with the way that they play going forward. Um, so it, yeah, there are going to be different challenges for all of them. Chelsea's challenge at the moment is that COVID has hit. It's uh, sort of it, it's particularly hit them in one area of the pitch, which yeah. is up in attack. And we're seeing the results of that, which is that an attack that was already kind of underperforming has just completely dried up in terms of goals. And it's, and it's a big problem. It is certainly a big problem. We'll get to a little bit more detail of that in just a second. One, going back to, you know, the decision to keep the Premier League going, you said it didn't actually get to a vote. So who actually made that call then? Is it like the head of the Premier League people that decided that? 
or was it a case of not enough of the clubs wanted a vote, therefore we didn't even get to a vote, therefore we're just continuing? Well, I think, um, I mean, I, I haven't been directly reporting on this, so I'm, I'm going on the reporting of, of people that I trust um, who've been following this story very closely, including colleagues at The Athletic. Um, but based on what I do know about the way things work, you know, Richard Masters, Premier League CEO, and Richard Scudamore, you know, when he was when, when he was in charge, primarily they work for the clubs. Um, you know, the, 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 the clubs are the, the shareholders of the league. They are the power, really. <laughs> Um, and of course, before the whole Super League debacle, it was primarily the big six clubs that were that were the biggest um, power brokers in the league. So if they want something to happen, the the Premier League's job is to kind of facilitate that happening. If it's in the interests of the clubs, it will generally happen. Um, so if if enough of them had wanted a vote and they'd made it clear to the Premier League that they wanted a vote on having a two week circuit breaker or whatever it would look like, I'm sure it would have gone to a vote um, and then we would have seen how much support it would have had. Perhaps, you know, based on the fact that it didn't even get to a vote, perhaps they they discussed it and realised, well, actually, there isn't enough support to even risk this because no one, no one wants to bring it to a vote and then get defeated <laughs> no, really exactly. badly. But, um, but so, uh, not... go, go on, go on, sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say, so I think they probably... The, if there were clubs that were in favour of a two-week circuit breaker, they probably preemptively said, oh, let's not have a vote because they, they probably talked to the other clubs and realised, well, actually not enough of our not enough of our rivals slash colleagues uh, agree with us that this is the right way to go. Not fair enough. But so it's not a case of, you know, Chelsea and Liverpool not wanting to continue or maybe Manchester United as well. And then some smaller clubs not agreeing with that because, oh, you know, look what you did with the Super League. Now we're not agreeing with you on these things. Or now there's a bigger chance for a slightly lesser clubs to get points of these big clubs because they have all these COVID, you know, in, you know, cases, I suppose. Um, so it's not a case of that. It's just, you know, there was no final agreement reached to stop anything, essentially. Well, I, I mean, I don't think you can rule out, you know, each club will have their own, own political kind of... Um aims and, and and their own sort of thoughts on on whether they would stand to benefit from this or not perhaps it perhaps it could be true that a couple of the smaller clubs would see this as some sort of leveler um that that you know if big clubs are getting hit hit hard by covid but forced to play their kind of b teams maybe there's a chance um more of a chance that you can take points off them i i don't know maybe that does feed into the into the thinking i wouldn't rule it out um, what I would say, though, is that Premier League clubs, they rarely all agree on anything. They rarely all come at an issue from exactly the same viewpoint. So you might have a couple of clubs thinking that. You might have a couple of other clubs thinking actually carrying on favours the big clubs um, because they've got the deepest squads and they're going to be the least affected. I mean, you saw Leeds bench <laughs> against against Chelsea um, yeah, and they didn't even have a, a big COVID outbreak. That's just a regular injury crisis. Um, and of course, the the team that Everton put out against Chelsea. So, th th those clubs don't have as much to turn to if they get hit hard by COVID. So, it, it it's very difficult to to kind of assess without being in the room the way all these different clubs would have been thinking about it. Fair. Um, just because you kind of just touched on it before, I let Pies take it to the recent results. One thing that I've been curious about, or that's been kind of bugging me, is why we see a lot of clubs, like you mentioned, their leads fill their bench, even start. You know, some of you know feel they're starting 11 with some of the under 23s, under 21s, under 19s. But Chelsea have so far not done that. I've seen Mizar Kinsella speak about it on Twitter yesterday where he's like, I'm unsure why they're not doing it. But to me, it seems a little bit strange. Like again, Zenit, we didn't feel the bench. I think against Everton, we didn't feel the bench completely. And we definitely didn't feel the, ben the bench completely against Wolves yesterday. What Do you have any idea what the thinking or the reasoning behind that is of not including, I don't know, Harvey Vale or... Um, you know, just a few of the others as well. Like, I'm sure there's there's a number that could, even if they're not planned to be like starting or even getting like significant minutes. Still, I would assume better to have a full bench and have the options if you have injuries than not. Yeah, I do think there's um, tr traditionally Chelsea's Chelsea's stance sort of since the pandemic began is that they've got these different training bubbles. They've got the first team bubble. They've got the development squad bubble. They've got the under 18 bubble, and where possible. Um, they they try to keep movement from one bubble to another to a minimum to try and help um, sort of mi minimise the risk of of outbreaks. Um, but equally, we have seen 
Um, we have seen, you know, earlier this season and in previous seasons that players from the development squad, players from the under 18s have been moved over, you know, to to take part in first team training or for the squad for cup games and, and things like that. So it can happen. It can be done. And there, so there's no practical reason why someone like Harvey Vale, for example, um, can't be involved and put on a Chelsea bench um, if needed. And I saw, you know, a tweet from Chelsea youth. I always take my lead on on all things academy from him, um, saying that apparently the you know well the under twenty threes and the under eighteens are done football wise. You know, get in terms of games and training for the year, so there would have been no football risk um, to to bring some of those into the first team squad. I suspect what you know what might have happened um, ahead of the Wolves game is that this this sort of cascade of positives that Chelsea had happened so quickly that maybe it happened too quickly for um, younger players to be brought in to train with the squad and be in position to step into, you know, the match day squad that, that that played that game. Equally, you can say maybe Chelsea could have shown a bit more foresight and had these guys training for the last week or two, just in case. Um, I, I don't know if there's a good answer to that other than they just didn't. And and and, yeah, and we end up and we end up with two goal two goalkeepers on the bench against Wolves. It I can see why people would be frustrated about it. Um, I think Chelsea's Chelsea's thinking is also that most of their best under twenty threes are currently playing for other clubs on loan. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do have a couple. You know, I, I mentioned Harvey Vale. I think he 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 probably is one of the biggest ones that comes to mind. Uh, who could probably step in and and do a job or 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 soak up some minutes if needed. Um, so yeah, it's there, there's no easy answer. It, it's possible that maybe Chelsea have made a bit of a a bit of a mistake, but I also think that circumstances with the COVID outbreak just kind of overtook them because it did seem like these positives snowballed very quickly over a few days. No, for sure. And I mean, Thomas Tuchel did make a fair point with both both pre and post game yesterday when he was talking about um, the fact that obviously traveling to to Wolverhampton three hours on a coach. I guess maybe the thinking is also if we basically infect the whole squad here now, if we bring the youth players on this very same coach, then they might also be infected. But if our whole first team is now done, at least we still have a few youth players left. I, I don't know, purely speculation on my side. But um, Pice, why don't you take us into, let's talk about the last two games. Obviously, Liam told us just before we started, he didn't actually get a chance to watch the, the Wolves game. Understandable, because he wasn't televised in the UK. Um, but obviously, he did see the last two games and essentially we've been struggling with the same thing or same things for a few weeks anyway. So nothing's really drastically changed in that point of view. But Pais, what in particular would, would you like to ask about or talk about? Because our form is not exactly brilliant at the moment, is it? Yeah, no, just a little bit just about what you think of the performances, Liam. Like for me, I was at the Everton game, specifically at home. I thought, I just thought we lacked real urgency, intensity in that game. Um, yeah, I just want to get your overall thoughts on the last few games and some of the players like, like Christian Pulisic, who's a quite a big talking point at the moment actually on on the Chelsea sort of fan side of Twitter um, like myself so I just want to get your thoughts like what do you think of some of these players that have come in do you think that they're necessarily impressing Tuchel because from a fan's point of view I don't and it's like it's a bit disappointing for me personally because I thought you know guys like Ziyech guys like Pulisic um, although he's been playing as a false nine you know especially the attack as you mentioned we've been hitting that area and it's just we're struggling to get over the line aren't we recently yeah, I think it's probably fair to say that quite a few of the attacking players that have played in the last few weeks haven't done their cause, you know, for for regular minutes once everyone's fit and available again, uh, much 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 good. You know, well Mason Mount has, you know, he's been the one carrying the load in the last couple of weeks and really adding more of a goal scoring edge to his game, which is promising for Chelsea overall. Cause just because they need someone to make that leap. Um, if if not him, then someone else. It just needs to be someone. Um, Pulisic just seems to be stuck in a in an in a in a never ending cycle of kind of you know straining to get his best rhythm. And we've seen what his best rhythm looks like and how good it can be, um, how devastating he can be to Premier League defenses. Um, and just getting sort of consistent injuries that, that that disrupt his momentum and set him back. I know he's been fit in the last couple of weeks, but he's he's also been, you know, sort of shifted around position. You mentioned being played as a false nine. I thought in the Everton game, um, to use that example, 
while he wasn't carrying a huge threat himself, I thought he was a part of why Chelsea actually played really well in the first half up to the box. I thought him, Mount, Ziyech had had good sort of positional interchange. We see a lot of that under Tuchel, don't we? Like, you know, the wide forwards changing positions with the wing backs and Pulisic was was kind of shifting into the channels and things. And because Everton had a makeshift defence, they looked like they couldn't really deal with it. And it was only because Chelsea couldn't finish that they didn't score two, three goals in that in that half. Um, and then once Tuchel made his subs in the second half, I actually thought he he made some big mistakes. Um, off, he he didn't have much to work with off the bench, um, but he made the team worse. He he shifted Pulisic to left left wing back, and and he completely disappeared from the game at that point. He was a complete non-factor from then on. Put Saul up front, and Saul looked completely ill at ease. I mean, he has pretty much everywhere he's played so far before that Wolves game, at least. Um, and Chelsea just completely lost control of the game from 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 that point on. So I I don't think Tuchel did did many favors there. Um, but but yeah, Pulisic is he he just seems like he he's straining to get back to to what his best rhythm is. Um, it doesn't help that he seems to get fouled a lot <laughs> by Premier League defenses. I feel I feel like Premier League defenders for some reason just take great pleasure in in fouling him. Um, in the same way that they did to Eden Hazard uh, back back in the day, um, and then Ziyech Ziyech has always been a feast or famine player. You know, even at Ajax, he when when he would put up great goal and assist numbers, he he's not he's not a guy you get for his pass completion. Um, he's he's going to play high risk balls and and make take the low percentage decision quite a lot. Uh, and when it comes off, it's great, and he can break teams open. And score great goals or or play passes that no one else can, but he can also be immensely frustrating to watch at times. And I feel like he's maybe the general impression I've had of Ziyech is that he's he's not as great a fit for Tuchel's more structured system. I actually think Ziyech looked really good at times under Lampard, where things were a bit more freeform, mm-hmm. um, and that kind of suited him because he you know he he would have the ability to he he would have the kind of leeway to go where he wanted and make make the decisions that he wanted in every area of the pitch and he's a he's a bit of a sort of maverick and artist in that sense um i don't think he's necessarily set to be part set up to be part of this sort of machine uh, that Tuchel wants to build but overall i just think chelsea still don't look um the sum of their parts in attack under Tuchel as great as the defense has been and it really has been great and as and as 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 good as the structure has been in terms of controlling games um the 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 attack has, has always kind of flattered to deceive um and and that was of course the reason why they went out and signed Romelu Lukaku in the summer he's not had he's not I don't think he's had enough time to establish whether he can be the solution to that because the injury is setting back he's not had enough training time with 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 the rest of Chelsea's forwards to build up real chemistry and the other guys have continued to to kind of struggle. I've been pretty disappointed with with Havertz this season. I thought he'd really kick on after his Champions League final goal. And, and not just that, the way he finished last season, I thought was really impressive. I thought Timo Werner couldn't be worse than he was last season. I don't think he has been, but he's he's just kind of been in and out of the team and not necessarily much better. Um, Hudson Adoy's, I think, had good moments when he's when he's been in the front three, which has been a little bit more this season than last. But he's he's still a young player that's going to have good moments of bad, and and he's not as clinical as as he could be yet. So I, it's a combination, I think, of younger players um, who maybe aren't you can't necessarily expect them to be as clinical as as Liverpool's front three or some of Manchester City's attackers, but also I just don't think the attacking system is quite working to its best to its best level yet and i think that's tuchel's main challenge from from here on out for sure and i mean we i'm pretty sure we have a fan question about it's, it's somewhat that topic later on coming anyway one two small things that i would like to touch on about what you just said i'll get to Romelu lukaku in just a second because i think that is an interesting thing to talk about that myself and pies have discussed a few times when we've been live streaming or recording videos on my channel but um in terms of the form, and you mentioned there, you know, struggling in attack, but obviously we also know that the, fo- the, the form, at least, and the results, at least, have dipped quite drastically since Ben Chilwell has picked up his injury. Obviously, it's not just Ben Chilwell. We're all aware of that, and it's not all just Marco Alonso's fault. But the problem is still that we lost one of our big wing backs, especially for a few weeks leading up to that. Ben Chilwell and Reese James together, that wing back combination was like 
kind of the biggest guarantee for our success most weeks. Like, look at the Newcastle game or a few other games as well. But then, obviously, the, the midfield problem started to kind of, like, tumble on top of each other consistently as well with, you know, Kante getting injured against Juventus. Then Kovacic picked up his, his hamstring injury. And then we found out Jorginho had been playing through pain. Ruben of cheek had apparently been playing through some sort of pain. Do you have any sort of insight in how, like, has all of that what we've been told through Thomas Tuchel, has that all been true or has some of that been more player protection? Or has is it all like, oh, Christensen's injured and Jorginho is always injured? Or how, like... Are they really playing through so much of a problem? I'm not trying to say, oh, Tuchel is lying, but I'm just trying to figure out how impressed am I meant to be by Jorginho for, about this, essentially, and how much of a blame can we still put on certain players? Like, is Pulisic fully over his ankle? Do you know what I mean? Like, how, how much of a problem are all these small niggas that we've been seemingly carrying all season? Well, I, I think you have to look at the broader context of how much football some of these top players have played in the last two, three years, not just recently. I mean, Jorginho went the distance in the Euros last summer, in addition to playing all the way up to the Champions League final. He he hasn't had a, much of a break, really. There was quite there was quite a short turnaround before this season. So it, I can completely believe that Jorginho is playing through pain. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of footballers play through minor injuries over the course of a season it's just I think I remember you know years and years ago Frank Lampard saying he played you know more than half a season with a broken toe (laughs) you know it's just it some of these guys they they have to be warriors at times um in terms of you know the pain that they can manage and lots of players play with pain killing pain killing injections and, and all sorts to to be able to go every three days for five six months um and I think those demands have only gotten greater as the as the schedule has become more and more crammed with different competitions um and then compressed by the disruption of covid uh, and what's that's what that's done to to the general calendar so I'd, i think you you have to look at it on a player by player basis in terms of their individual load and that's what chelsea will will do they always they they have bespoke training regimes depending on you know how much each player is having to having to cope with um and that and that obviously will translate to when, when they come back from pre-season as well um some will come back earlier than others Jorginho I think yeah it, it makes sense that you would want to try and protect him what happens in a situation like this is that you get a couple of injuries and then it's very easy for it to snowball because it puts a bigger load on all the other guys the games don't stop coming and Chelsea are trying to compete on all fronts and they're at least until a couple of weeks ago, they were top of a Premier League title race in which even a draw is a disaster. So you have no margin for error. You have to play really good players or your best players a lot to to, to keep winning. Um, and, and so Kante's at a point in his career where injuries have become more of a factor over the last couple of years. Um, and that obviously goes back to Sarri's time. Um and Kovacic, I mean, he's actually been quite durable, hasn't he? Uh, he? He's had a couple of injuries during his Chelsea career. He's generally been quite durable. Um, it's just quite unfortunate that him, Kante and Jorginho have all been either out or limited at the same time. This is the first time under Tuchel that all three of those players have either been unavailable or or severely limited. And I think you've seen, you know, I, I spoke about it on our podcast, that the kind of brain of the team isn't there. And and the guys that you have below them, you know, the Loftus Cheek, Saul, if you put Trevor Chalabar in midfield, or or even Reese James, um, while they're not perfect solutions, I think they could work if they were next to one of those three guys. Mm-hmm. If if you have two of them without any of those three top guys, it doesn't work at all. Yeah, exactly. Suddenly, suddenly Chelsea look, Loftus Cheek is yeah. still great next to Jorginho sometimes, but then when yeah. he was next to Saul against Watford, it was awful. Yeah, because I think those those three midfielders are all legitimately elite at what they do. They're elite in terms of their understanding of this position of this system, um, and and what Tuchel wants from them. And the guys below them just aren't quite up to that level. And I, I do think Loftus Cheek's been good this year. I think he's been he, he's been a, a, a particularly a feel good story after everything he's been through. For him to come in and be solid as he has been in a lot of games has, has been really nice to see. But I think he's he needs to be solid next to one of those three i don't think it can be you know reese james and and saul or someone like that it's going to be problems 
um, because they, they just don't have that same level of understanding of the position or the system. For sure. And, and Ruben, to be fair, has played so much recently. I swear, he feels like he's played more than Kante has in the last 12 months, just in the last two months. You know, Ruben has played so many games for... None of us expected that, you know, the start of the season that Loftus Cheek would played that many games. But one thing brought up earlier in terms of, you know, just our attack struggling. And then to fix said problem, because we had said problem last season, even under Thomas Tuchel, about winning the Champions League. We did spend £100 million on a strike on Romelu Lukaku. And now, of course, he's been injured for two and a half-ish months. But then, you know, the whole him coming back has obviously been hampered now by him catching covid the, the thing that's been super frustrating to me personally is whenever we've used him, even obviously his debut was amazing against Arsenal. Then he still had a few other games where against Villa, where he scored two brilliant goals, they had it against Zenit, all brilliant. But then things started to, at least in my opinion, slowly like, you know, dampen out a little bit and it got a bit mm. more of a struggle and we didn't really create much. And then there was the Juve game where a lot of Chelsea fans were like going at each other. Like, is it Lukaku's fault or is it all the creators fault that we're not giving Lukaku better chances? But the frustrating thing for me is, for, we've, we're almost using Lukaku like he's Giroud, but he's not. He's so much more than Giroud. So why are we using him like he's Giroud? And I just don't really understand why. And also, yeah. we've not really tried some different. The only t- time we've maybe tried something different was away at Zenit when it was kind of a front two with Lukaku half off the right. But that was more forced due to all the players missing rather than, at least that's what it seemed like to me, rather than trying to use a different system to make Lukaku work. And I just, if you spend 100 million pounds on a striker I feel like I'm confused why if I feel like you would you need to try everything to make him work because he's the guy you because we like you just touched on earlier the other guys are either too young or not consistent enough or whatever to rely on them consistently in attack like we had the same you mentioned it down the Lampard we had you know the problem was the defense we couldn't keep any clean sheets but the attacking problems were very similar to the attacking problems we had on the Tuchel at times but on the Tuchel obviously we're just so much more solid defensively that one or two goals usually enough but on the Frank it sometimes wasn't which is kind of half the problem but now that we have Lukaku I'm curious do you happen to know what the thinking within the Chelsea camp is with Thomas Tuchel like how like are they frustrated by Lukaku not working better when he was fit obviously and obviously now coming back or are they very calm about it? That it will come and we will figure this out. Or is there a bit of a worry like, no, not another striker at Chelsea that doesn't work? Well, I think they're probably frustrated that the the kind of adaptation process is still at a relatively primitive stage. Um, I think they would have hoped that by December, they would have been well down the road in terms of properly assimilating the Kaku into this attack and actually you know, remoulding the attack around him in a way that elevates Chelsea into the kind of elite attacking team that Liverpool are or Manchester City are. Um, That hasn't happened for a variety of circumstances that we've discussed. I think it all goes back to the summer to start with. The fact that Chelsea, you know, the fact that Inter kind of delayed things um, and Lukaku got to Chelsea quite late and then had to quarantine and, you know, that... By the time he was actually training, it was basically the season. Um, So what we've seen is that Chelsea have had to try and figure out Lukaku's fit on the pitch rather than on the training pitch. Um, And I I think Tuchel would much rather have had a couple of weeks with him, at least, to try and get things nailed down and try to get the beginnings of those combinations with some of the other forwards that Chelsea have. Um, You know try to try to get those combinations at least at kind of like an early stage um of chemistry before the real football started and that didn't happen and he still played well in the first couple of games because i think teams weren't ready for what he brings arsenal in particular were at a really low ebb at that point and they were perfect opponents for him um and he you know he was doing his you know, basketball fans out there will know you know he's kind of football in post ups standing with his back to Pablo Marie and just kind of backing him down, twisting, spinning him and and or laying the ball off and running in. Um, and I think after the first couple of games, because other Premier League teams watch your film <laughs> of what you've done, Chelsea's next opponents reacted to that and started putting midfielders in front of Lukaku to screen those entry passes. Um, and so... At that point, you have to try and figure out more sophisticated ways to get Lukaku involved in your build-up play. Um, And I think Chelsea were in the process of trying to do that when he got the ankle injury. 
Um, and then everything gets put on hold for, I think, much longer than anyone originally anticipated with it. Um, and it's taken him time. That he's, I don't think he's still still not completely 100% match sharp after that. Um, and then COVID hit, so it's delayed again. And in the meantime, you have all the other... Because he's out, Chelsea then have to kind of become the attacking team they were last season, where it's all these kind of interchangeable pressing forwards rather than one point of reference um, and, and people playing around him. Um, and now even so Havertz is out, so we can't even do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's just been no stylistic consistency in the attacking third of the pitch for Chelsea. And in, and in the end... I think that starts to take a toll into in your production. And as much as you can say, I think in the last few games, just plain poor finishing has, has been a big part of Chelsea's struggle. I think that kind of systemic inconsistency that you just don't get at Liverpool, you just don't get at Manchester City. You know, I know Manchester City have a lot of in- interchangeable attacking midfielders and forwards, but they all kind of slot into the same system. And they all know what they're doing and no one really misses a beat. Chelsea don't have that. Um, and they 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 want to have that around Lukaku. Lukaku is different to all of Chelsea's other forwards. He's different to... He necessitates a change in the way that they played last season in attack. But Tuchel wanted that and Chelsea wanted that. That's why they went out and paid so much money for him because they recognised we cannot win the Premier League title with Jorginho as our top scorer. No. Well, we and we cannot win the Premier League title with you know Reese James on a goal scoring tear from wing back as our top scorer. You need a forward who can get you 20 league goals minimum. You know, that that, that was Diego Costa the last time Chelsea won the league. They need that again, and they believe Lukaku, they still believe Lukaku will be that, but it's just it might not actually happen this season because they might run out of time given the time that he's missed and the time that they need to to get this right. Um, and that and that's where the frustration is. But I, I think there there is a plan for Lukaku. They wouldn't have signed him otherwise. Um, I think Tuchel genuinely wants to work with him and maximise him and maximise the players around him. But they just they just need the time to do it, and they haven't really had it yet. Fair. Two stop start this season, isn't it? I think with Lukaku and, and just the players around him, but. Yeah, I mean, all, all the stuff you said there, really interesting, really insightful. Um, me, personally, I, I back Lukaku a lot, um, I hope. And I, I do believe he will be the, the striker that we need because I, I believe he's very, very clinical. Um, and, and yeah, I, I believe he's got a lot of attributes to succeed here. But, Liam, we've got about 15, 20 minutes left. We want to talk to you quickly about some contracts and, and transfer stuff maybe coming up. So, just first off, quickly on the, on the um, contracts... Rudiger and Christensen, with me personally, obviously, I'm a subscriber for Athletics, so I read a lot of what's posted, especially with Rudiger. I mean, it seems like we've had that one offer of 140000 per week, correct me if I'm wrong, to Rudiger. But, I mean, what do you think is going to happen with these two guys? Because Christensen, as well, was, it wasn't a concern, and now he's becoming a, a bit more of a concern, right? Because, you know, he, he was originally supposed to sign the contract, and then apparently his players can't change thing or something. So... Um, yeah, what what do you think is going to happen with those two guys? Because I guess a follow up question is <laughs> if Rudiger or hopefully not both leave, both Rudiger and Christensen, Jor Kunde is is the one we were supposed to sign last summer, Liam, and and that sort of came down to a difference in price valuation. So what do you think is going to happen in this centre back position? Because it's, it seems like a right mess. Yeah, it's very much in flux. Um, and I think it's probably more in flux than a lot of people expected it to be. You know, we we knew going into this season that you had the Champions League starting back three um, plus Christensen all with a year to go. Um, but I think, you know, I, I anticipated that Christensen would be at least would be sorted very quickly. I thought from the beginning that Rudiger would be a very complicated one. And, um, you know, j- to be very clear, I'm not reporting anything. I haven't heard any anything new on that situation. Um, but my instinct all along with Rudiger is that he will leave um, just because the market forces tend seem to be moving in that direction. It, I, I've compared his situation throughout to Ginny Wijnaldum at Liverpool last season, where you have a guy, a really high, um, high value, high producing player, 
um, in his late twenties, who knows his next contract will be his last big one, um, and knows the value of free being a free agent. You know, getting to free agency, knowing that the clubs that might be interested in you, or or Chelsea, um, if you if you leverage them, um, will give you more money. Uh, you know, clubs that if there are other clubs outside of Chelsea that want you they would rather give all that money to you than pay Chelsea a massive transfer fee and then sit down with you to talk about wages. Um, and it it worked out, at least in financial terms, for, for Wijnaldum. You know, he got a massive offer. He got an offer from Barcelona and then a massive offer from PSG. Ended up going there. I know, he's, I know it's not really working out on the pitch for him, um, but he's earning a lot of money. Um, and Liverpool just said, no, we're not willing to do that. And I think Chelsea it seems, have drawn a similar contractual line in the sand with Rudiger saying that this is our offer. This is the le- this is what we value at, value you at. Um, and we're not willing to go beyond that. Now, whether they do, whether they come back with a final offer that is improved, maybe, may, maybe that makes a difference. Um, but, you know, if the most outlandish numbers are to be believed and, and Real Madrid are, are you know, prepared to offer him say four hundred grand a week. I I'm almost certain. That's Again, outrageous. without 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 talking to people in the situation, I don't know what Chelsea's thinking <laughs> is internally. I'm almost certain, based on everything we know about the way Chelsea act on contracts, that they would not do that. They would not go near that oh, for a player man. going into his thirties. Can you can you con- either confirm or deny? Hey, if you don't know, you don't know. But can you either confirm or deny that Rudiger's initial demands were? at £200,000 a week. Because we can talk about now that Real Madrid offer, whatever PSG might offer him, now that we let it get to a stage where they can offer him a contract in January. But if £200,000, that's my perspective. Obviously, I'm I'm not you know in charge of the economics at Chelsea Football Club. I'm not in charge of the money there. I'm not in charge of whatever they've got planned about which big money signings they might sign in January who are going to be on crazy wages or whatever. But my thinking is if Timo Werner, at least what you can find when you research the internet, when you see the type of money team of Werner is on, and then only in obviously quotation marks offering Antonio Rudiger one hundred and forty thousand pounds a week, to me is weird. Especially when we won the Champions League mostly relying on our defense. Like we're not like our attack isn't even doing anything. So why are we paying them? Are we perfectly happy to pay all these guys so much money? But Rudiger, no. That's the part I personally don't understand. Obviously, if he now wants way more than two hundred k, I get it, right? I understand. But if that was his initial demand, which is why I'm asking. I don't really understand why we had to lowball it at 140, to be honest. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But I, I, I also do believe that Rudiger was always going to go into to go into free agency, you know, to use a, okay. an American sports term. I always believed that he was going to do that because it's in his interest. Whether even if he ends up coming back to Chelsea, it's in his interest, I think, to let his contract run down True. and assess his options because then he can either use rival offers to leverage Chelsea to get that number up or he can just take one of those massive paydays um, and enjoy the next four years at an elite European club earning massive massive you know sort of Galactico money Um, I think if he was going to stay at Chelsea at the very least you know what sort of personality Rudiger is he's clearly not short of confidence or belief in himself he would want to be one of the top earners in Chelsea squad at a minimum and 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 because, like you say, you know, I, you believe he was a he, the defense, and therefore, you know, him was a key reason why Chelsea won the Champions League. You can bet he believes that as well. Um, and his agent would have been making that point <laughs> rather forcefully in any conversations. So, um, you know, he he has a he has a a perception of his value. Um, and the problem with these situations comes when his perception of his value and Chelsea's perception of his value are a long way apart. Um, and I think Chelsea, generally speaking, like I said, I can't, I can't speak to their thinking on, on this case. Cause I haven't been directly reporting on Rudiger, at least not in the last couple of months. Um, but their general thinking is that they don't want to pay players for past production. They don't want to pay players for their peak years um, into their post peak years. You know, you'd be paying Rudiger peak money, the biggest money he's ever earned in his career when he becomes 32, 33 years old. That's just not traditionally the way Chelsea have operated. The only player I can think of that they've made an exception to for that is N'Golo Kante. Um, 
who is kind of one of one of one and is and is on big money heading into his 30s but they don't like tying up their their books in that way i think they they look at what happened at arsenal with Ozil and Aubameyang now um and what's happened to manchester united with you know players like alexis sanchez uh, I know they brought, you know, they brought in Bastian Schweinsteiger, didn't they, a couple of years ago on a big last payday, and it it rarely works. And that, you know, I say that as someone who has huge respect for Rudiger and what he's doing. I think he's playing the best football of his career right now. He is legitimately one of the best centre backs in Europe, uh, certainly in this system in a back mm-hmm. three. I don't, I don't think we've seen him be world class in a back four at Chelsea, but in a back three, he's been excellent. Um, and 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 he knows his value is at its highest right now. To if not to Chelsea, then certainly to other clubs. So I, I've always felt that he will leave, um, and not because he doesn't like Chelsea or <laughs> or anything like that. I just think it, the the market forces are, are leaning that way. If 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 Madrid or any of these other big European clubs are willing to offer him that kind of money, I just don't think Chelsea will match it. No, but. Christensen, on the other hand, do you still feel yeah. hopeful that that contract will eventually be signed, especially after this whole drama we had where he seems to have been left out of squads, or not the squad, but out of starting 11s, mostly due to not having signed this contract and even Thomas Tuchel going as far as publicly saying, well, you know, basically, to, you know, stop talking the talk, but also, also walk the bloody walk and actually sign the thing. Yeah, Christensen's the fascinating one for me. Um because I I don't think Chelsea had a great deal of concern about it going into the year. I think they were very happy with where they were at with Christensen. I think they got the impression that Christensen was very happy with where he was at at Chelsea, where if he wasn't always starting, he was the fourth centre back. And when one of the th- one of the three centre backs ahead of you is thirty seven, you know you're going to get a lot of minutes. Um, and and he got a lot of big minutes, and he he felt important at Chelsea at last, and was play- again kind of recaptured his best form that he'd showed under under Antonio Conte a couple of years ago. Um, so I don't think there was a great deal of concern heading into the season, but uh, um, my colleague Simon Johnson's documented the, the negotiations very well um, in The Athletic. There have been a few changes of heart from the Christensen side over the length of contract he wants. Um, and and I think that that that's kind of chilled things. Um, it, it, there's been a feeling from from the Chelsea side at least that Christensen's camp are kind of moving the goalposts a little bit. They don't want him on a three year contract. They want him on a five year contract because he's a player in his mid twenties who's immensely valuable. They don't really want to. If you sign someone to a three year contract, realistically, you'd be talking about a new contract one year from now because two years out is usually when these conversations begin. Um, so I can I can understand why Chelsea are reluctant to do that. Christensen, again, as more players are doing right now, is thinking about a kind of free agency, you know, kind of kind of model of if I if it's a three year deal, that gives him the opportunity to to potentially become a free agent when he's the age that Rudiger is now, and you may be looking for one last big big payday. Um, so I think that's the awkward position Chelsea are in. But I I'm still kind of optimistic that it will get done that that's speaking very much from the sort of outside of the situation just because i think it's far more in chelsea's interests to get christensen tied down purely because of his age than it is rudiger because you you can be pretty confident that barring a kind of catastrophic injury you're going to get really high level production from christensen for the duration of that contract if you sign him to to say a five-year deal on on big money um i think i think he if he was made, you know, in the top half of earners in the squad, I think he would earn that. I think he would be good value for okay. that. But I think he'll take over Thiago Silva's spot at some point. And he, he can be, if not the leader, then certainly a, a key component of of the next great Chelsea defence. So, so I'm, I'm optimistic that one will get done. Not so much on Rudiger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On that very note, though, you just touched on Thiago Silva. Just quickly, Thiago Silva and Aspilicueta, obviously their contracts are also running out. Are you expecting those two um, to sign an extension? Well, everything I've heard, every time I've asked about Aspilicueta, um, I've been told, yeah, don't worry. He really wants to stay. He's the ultimate club man. Chelsea love him. Um, no one's worried about it. It will get done. I don't really know why it's ticking down. I could... I, I can only assume that it's ticking down because Chelsea are focusing on Rudiger and Christensen 
Um, and then they're just not... No, if it is true that really no one is worried about Aspilicueta, we've seen Chelsea do this before, you know, with John Terry, Gary Cahill, players that are really seen as Chelsea men. They're not they're not necessarily that frightened of letting it run all the way down and then signing, you know, like a contract extension, even in the summer um, to, to roll on for another year or two, because they're not worried about the player, you know, taking an offer from elsewhere in the, in the meantime, I don't, I don't, at least what I was hearing the last couple of months, Chelsea weren't overly worried um, about as Piliqueta taking an offer from somewhere else. And as Piliqueta wasn't, planning to do so that wasn't the way he was thinking about it he's really really settled at Chelsea he loves the club um he's really really settled in London he's got he's got his whole life here he's been here a long time I I've heard from people that he would be very he would be inclined to live in England after he retires um rather than go back to Spain because he's so settled here uh so you know the impression I've always been given is that Azpilicueta will stay until it's done, we can't say for certain. Um, but you know, I, I I would be surprised. I would still be surprised if he left, just because he's become so sort of embedded in the club. And Thiago Silva, I mean, he's still playing at a really high level, isn't he? He's he's playing brilliantly. Um, so I, I think, um, and and he wants to he wants to keep playing at a high level at least until the Qatar World Cup because he wants to play for Brazil there. It seems like a, a marriage that fits everyone. I think for him to stick around for, for we love him. Another, another year. Yeah, he's he's hugely respected at Chelsea. Obviously, Tuchel loves him. He's coached him for years. Um, his his leadership, as much as anything, is immensely valued. But he's still producing like an elite centre back on the pitch as well, which is a, a massive bonus for a player of his age. Yeah. Okay. So, just to touch on lastly, Liam, just a few like few transfer stuff. I want to ask you before we let you go. Thanks so much for your time so far today. Um, as you mentioned there, you've always had that instinct that you think Rudiger will leave. So, Joel Kunde, as I mentioned before, primary defensive target still for Chelsea? Because, I mean, last summer I thought he was going to join, then it was like, oh, it's broke down. <laughs> but, I mean, I've been watching him this season. He is a really, really good talent. Um, can play right back, right centre back, plays in back fours. Seems like a logical signing right for Chelsea if maybe Sevilla um, lower their valuation a little bit, I guess. Yeah, it, well, I mean, in, tying it to the Rudiger situation is awkward because Rudiger plays on the left. Yeah, so yeah of course. Yeah. It, it depends whether Chelsea see Kunde as someone who could play on the left of a back three. Um, if it, if it's on the right, you know, you're competing against Trevor Chalaba. Depends how much Tuchel believes in him. All the signs are that he he really does like Chalaba, um, and Chalaba certainly merited Tuchel's faith this year. As Pilaquetta's getting older. Um, so there, there could be a spot anyway on the right side of that back three, at least, uh, you know, at least to come in and, and, and bolster the, you know, add to the squad competition with, you could have maybe Koundé and Chalaba vying for that spot. Um, it depends on what Sevilla's position is really. Cause I, you know, I, Chelsea weren't willing to meet the asking price last year. I think they, I think they were expecting it to be a bit more reasonable given the, given the COVID climate. I think they were hoping they could get Koundé for a, for a more reasonable fee, it was clear that the player really wanted to join, uh, and was really disappointed that the move didn't happen. So I'm sure if Ch- if Chelsea picked it up again next year, um, they they would be very confident of turning Kounde's head again, um, and that he would be keen to make the move. But it depends whether Sevilla will have softened at all on their valuation. Because if Chelsea weren't willing to pay it a year ago, I'm not I'm not necessarily sure what would have changed really. Um, yeah. But the, the 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 advantage for them of letting Rudiger walk is obviously you lose a hugely valuable asset for nothing. But Chelsea are also thinking about their wage bill, and you do, you don't put a massive wage for Rudiger on that wage bill, and that gives you a bit more flexibility to do something else and bring other defensive reinforcements in. Um, and Chelsea will back themselves. They always do to, to get that right. Koundé fits into the bracket like someone like Havertz or Ziyech. He fits into the bracket of someone they've monitored for several years. So I would be a bit surprised if they just sort of abandoned any any interest in him. In, in him. I'm sure they're still watching him. It's just yeah. whether they. The, it's just whether the number the the fee works. Yeah, but you can rule out that it won't be 
anything in January, right? Because obviously, the, if we do lose Rüdiger plus one in the summer, we're in desperate need for a centre back. So, like you just touched on there, depending on the position of Sevilla, the more desperate we are, the less mm. you know willing to yeah. lower their demand they're going to be. So, hence why I'm like, for that reason, maybe do we look at it in January? I doubt it personally, but you know, just I've got to ask. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I rule nothing out, but. I think it's hard to do deals of that size in January, particularly when you're when the club on the other side of the table, in this case Sevilla, has plenty to play for themselves. Um, I think they're they're generally much more open to losing key players in the summer when they've got more time to to build their squad for a new season um, than than mid year and, and having to patch things together. We know, you know, we know from everything that they've achieved over the last few years. Sevilla are no mugs. They're one of the best run clubs in Europe. So um, they're, they're going to get what they deem value for Koundé and they're going to, if they do sell him, um, they're going to sell him on their terms and probably their timetable. So I, I'd be, again, kind of sort of just speaking from the outside, I'd be, I'd be surprised if they were prepared to let him go for in mid-season. I'd kind of be surprised if Chelsea pushed for it as well um in mid season i think if, if chelsea were to do anything in january the only thing that Tuchel has referenced in the last couple of weeks is that maybe if chilwell's injury proves significant maybe you see them enter the market for a left wing back but yeah that, Liam, that would be an, inter- that would Liam, be an interesting sorry. one as well wouldn't it yeah i was i was just going to ask you quickly about that because one situation that's cropped up is lucas digne from everton Obviously, he's fell out with Rafa Benitez and Fabrizio Romano just said they agreed like a £20 million deal for a Ukrainian left-back. So, Mikalenko, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I'm not wrong, I'm pretty sure we've had interest in Digne in the past, right? So, I know Everton are a very, very hard and awkward team to deal with. You only have to look at, you know, Stone. Especially with Chelsea. <laughs> yeah, Especially yeah. Especially with like, Chelsea. We don't, have a, we don't have a great relationship, but do you think like, like, Digne might back, be a good one? You know, <laughs> yeah, no. Like, do you think Digne could be a good one? And because I, I personally think that makes it's a deal that makes quite a lot of sense if Chilwell has to have surgery. I think he fits. He, he fits the profile of a type of signing that Chelsea have made in part in the past, particularly in in January. You know, Chelsea Chelsea pride themselves on as well as having like a broader transfer strategy. They they pride themselves on being pretty good opportunists. Um, you know, when 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 they see things present themselves and players that they've they've liked in the past suddenly become available for a reasonable fee, they they do they can move quite quickly. And we saw that with um, you know, one that comes to mind obviously from January is like Olivier Giroud, the kind of archetypal January opportunist signing um that that, that Chelsea made. Dean Dean kind of fits that bracket. He's been a he's been a productive player for Everton, pretty much the only one of uh well, no, actually, Yeri, I was going to say he's the only one of that Barcelona deal they did that's been consistently good for them. But Yerry Mina's been all right as well. Um, but he's a, he, he's a player that could come in and I think do a, do a high level job as a wing back. Um, the the interesting element for me is that from a strategy point of view, does that mean that long term you're you're planning to move on Alonso because Chilwell's not going to be out forever? You know, if if he's out beyond January, it won't be. It won't. It, it might. It might be for the rest of the season. I don't know. I think they're still trying to figure out the severity of that injury. But there's a there's a chance he could be back before the end of the year, and you don't really want to get into get into a position like you had with Emerson, Chilwell, Alonso. Where you've got these three guys, three left wing backs that you're trying to shoehorn into the squad and end up playing Emerson the left of a back three. Um, so well, I, maybe maybe that would have striker, implications, you know, Alonso. We could bring that? anyone as a striker. Or just play Alonso up front, you know. That's what I mean. Yeah, exactly. I don't so get why we didn't do that against Everton. Chuck Alonso up top, you know, before. <laughs> I don't get why we yeah. didn't do that against Everton, you know. Put Alonso strike. <laughs> the the other element to the Dean um, thing that's interesting is that Everton hate selling to Chelsea. They absolutely hate selling to Chelsea. It, John Stones didn't happen. Um, and 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 Chelsea were frustrated in their pursuit of Ross Barkley for a long time before they finally got him, and of course Romelu Lukaku as well. That that whole circus. Everton do not like selling to Chelsea when they can possibly avoid it. Is there but, a particular reason for that? I just don't think they like Chelsea. <laughs> I don't Fair think I, I don't I don't think at board level, 
this is kind of harder for Everton to sustain now as a position. But I think at board level, there's kind of there seemed to be a perception that like Chelsea are everything. We're not, you know, they're the, they're the southern new money. We're like the northern old traditional club, um, and it certainly reflected the fan base. The Everton fan base certainly seems to feel that way about Chelsea. But now Everton have all this new money, and they've been acting a bit more like Chelsea in the last few years, albeit not spending well. Um, but that 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 introduces another element, I think, to any potential discussions that might happen for Dean is that um, Everton need to raise some money to spend because they've got a lot of money tied up in their wage bill and they've bought a lot of players that they can't shift. So if there's a player that Rafa Benitez has made clear that he doesn't want or a player that he's fallen out with for whatever reason, it makes sense for them to to move him on and not be too picky about where they move him on to because that money... Rafa Benitez will be pushing to reinvest money um, yeah. in, in, in the squad. And they don't have, you saw what they did last summer, you know, Damari Gray, 1.5 million Andres Townsend on a free. They, they had nothing to spend because they've, they, they have to stay within the Premier League's financial rules. They have to sell to buy. Yeah. Okay, Liam. So one more player before we let you go. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a lot of questions, but one more player. I know that Chelsea have been scouted from what I've read. You know, they've scouted this guy for quite a few times now. So, Hopefully, I don't butcher his name, but it's Aurelien Schuermeni from Monaco, I believe. <laughs> I believe that's his name, but again, another player that I've been watching uh, a lot. He's a very, very good player. Um, do you potentially think Chelsea could purchase him as sort of a longer-term Kante replacement? Because obviously, Kante has, you know, more injuries nowadays. I know there's talk of Declan Rice, but I mean, personally, I think there's not much... Um, there's not much point of talking about Rice because I don't think West Ham are going to lower his valuation. Personally, I don't know if you think different, but yeah, have you heard anything on on Schuermeni or, or Rice particularly? Because I think um, maybe Chelsea buy a midfielder, right? Or may, maybe they don't. Maybe they they bring Conor Gallagher back because he's been sensational this season for Palace. And I know Tuchel said he liked him previously. Just your thoughts and any information you've heard? Yeah. Uh... Chimeni feels like um, it's got the beginnings of a sort of Leandro Damiao to Tottenham, you know, like for a, a forever saga where they're sort of dancing around each other window after window. Um, it's been a, it's been a while now that his name's been linked, hasn't it? Um, and that rarely happens without, you know, some sort of substance in terms of I'm, I'm pretty confident, you know, he's on the list of players that Chelsea are regularly scouting and players that they like. I'm sure he's on Scott McLaughlin's list um, uh, in, in terms of playing players they're looking closely at. He fits, he fits the age bracket. I must say I haven't watched him in any great detail, um, so I can't really speak to his game. I know I know he's very highly regarded um, as, as kind of a sort of all-action midfielder, very well-rounded skill set. Um, but it, I, I don't know. It, he he could be he, he could be certainly a, a more low cost option um, to someone like Rice because I f- I feel like with with West Ham they're the best they've been on the pitch in years under David Moyes and Rice is a huge part of that. Um, so it, just in terms of their footballing project, they're in a really strong position to keep him for the time being. I know he's not signing a new contract at the moment because I think he's realised that that's probably in the longer term, his main avenue out of West Ham is he needs more leverage. Um, but if I'm right in thinking, I think that contract still runs to 2024 or something. Um, so the clock isn't really ticking for West Ham yet. And it it might be quite a bit of time before they, they start to feel the heat um, to sell Declan Rice. And he, he doesn't seem like, or at least he's shown no inclination so far, to really force the issue and put in a transfer request or, or you know, do what Harry Kane did this summer and, and really try and put their feet to the fire. Um, he value, he seems to value his relationship with the fans too much and f- fair play to him. Um, you know, he, he's, he's a beloved figure there. Um, so I, I don't see the rice one as, as happening anytime soon. I think Tuchel likes him as well. And, and why wouldn't he? I think rice is, is a top quality player who's very, very capable of playing in, in that double six mm-hmm. to a very high level. Um, I, I feel like the, the interesting thing for Chelsea going into next summer is that unless you move on one of Jorginho, Kante, Kovacic, you are, if you're recruiting, 
you're recruiting for the fourth spot. And that's quite a hard sell. To, and that you could to, argue to, Conor Gallagher, Billy Gilmore, do you know what I mean? Could be. It could be. But the, the problem is, neither of them wanted that job last summer. That's why they're on loan. Because Gil, Gilmore had already spent a year as the fourth midfielder, not got many minutes under Lampard and then and then Tuchel. He understandably wanted to play and, and actually, you know, get Premier League reps. And and he's he's got that at Norwich by and large. Conor Gallagher's been brilliant for, for Crystal Palace. Um, and I think he would certainly enhance Chelsea's squad. And I tweeted a couple of weeks ago, you know, it Chelsea shouldn't be looking to sign a central midfielder this summer if and the caveats I didn't include in the tweet. The caveats are, you know, if they want to bring Gallagher back, which I think he's certainly good enough to play for Chelsea from next season. Um, and if they keep those top three guys, because how are you going to convince um, a really top quality central midfielder, even an up and coming one like maybe Chimeni, to come in and be the fourth guy in that squad? It's it's hard. It, you know, even if you can say there might be another, then there might be another situation like this season where all three of Kovacic, Jorginho, Kante are out at the same time, and you'll get plenty of minutes. It's it's still you've got three high level, really high level international players um, for for those two spots before you even start talking about you. And Ruben Loftus Cheek's there, and well, we can only assume Sal Niguez won't be, but Chelsea will always have plenty of options for those positions. Um, so I think it's just quite a difficult recruiting pitch as long as Jorginho, Kante, Kovacic are there. If you move one of them on, and you'd say maybe the likeliest would be would be Jorginho, given that the buzz never seems to truly go away about him going to Italy someday. Um, but could any clubs in Italy actually afford the money we would ask for? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the broader that's the broader market question, not just for Jorginho, for a lot of. Premier League players is that the Premier League has now so far outstripped the other major European leagues um, that I actually think it's a big problem for for big Premier League clubs because as soon as they they they've ended up with all these players on the fringes of their squad that are on wages that European clubs just can't pay, um, so their only option really is to sell to another Premier League club and at the moment and no one wants to that, do that either. <laughs> yeah, at the moment even that market has kind of receded a bit because of because of covid and all the uncertainty around it um so yeah it, it's a it's a very difficult market to sell players at the moment and that's why i think that's had a knock on effect to to chelsea's recruitment you know they went out and spent big on lukaku last year because he was a a singular talent that addressed the singular need but mm-hmm. i'm not sure you're going to see the kind of recruitment drive we saw from chelsea 2 years ago again anytime soon just because they've got so many players under contract now that they can't shift um and you can't just have a billion low knees forever <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, can you, you can try you can try if any club could try chelsea could try but um yeah, exactly you know, at some point you have to think about your wage bill and, and the squad mm. size and all of these things for sure but i think i think we're going to round it out here one thing that i was because it just tied in into what you said two kind of small solutions into well if we don't have enough spots in midfield change the formation and make another spot in midfield. And what we've seen a lot of, you know, people when we announced that we're going to record with yourself, um, what a lot of people were asking is like, is there any thought at Chelsea going on, whether it's Tuchel or, you know, the people above, about switching to a back four? And that obviously we spoke about um, Antonio Rüdiger and potentially even Andreas Christensen leaving. Are we looking at, in terms of centre-backs, more at back four centre-backs or at back three centre-backs because they're not necessarily the same type of target that you need to look at. Obviously, Kunde might might be an exception who works for both, but some other players might not. And do you happen to have any inkling on which side of the coin we're kind of focusing on more? Because it's an interesting one. Like you touched there for midfield. If we want a midfielder, unless we sell someone, we probably need to add another midfield position. Otherwise, how is that going to work? Yeah, and I think it... It's interesting from Tuchel's perspective because we've seen from his coaching career that he's not wedded to one system. This is not an ideological thing that he's a a 3-4-3 slash 3-5-2 coach. Um, But he came into Chelsea, he assessed the squad and he made a pragmatic decision that this system fit the players that were here. Mm -hmm. Now, the key question, as you say, is looking forward, do you recruit for this system? Or do you recruit based on how you might want to tactically evolve the team over time? 
and maybe you want to try and recruit with a view to shift into a back four at some point. At the moment, with the players Chelsea have, Tuchel has has been very clear. Regardless of you know when Chelsea have had bad results, he's battered it away every single time. He believes this system is the best fit for this group of players. And mm. while you might see in very rare situations within games Chelsea move away from it, it seems like f- for the time being it will always be Chelsea's starting system. Um, and and if need be, he's prepared to shoehorn players into it uh, just to just to keep that back three and the double six and that kind of the control and the defensive solidity that offers. Um, but I do think it's a big question if if Tuchel is going to, you know, last long term at Chelsea, which is always a huge if at Chelsea with a coach. Um, does he d- does he want to evolve this team beyond three four three three five two? doesn't necessarily have to but you know it might be it might be a way to make chelsea a more potent attacking team because you can't get around the fact that they're starting with three nominally three attacking players on the pitch in any given game i know that the wing backs play as forwards quite a lot of the time but if you're only starting with three forwards and then you're struggling to score it's easy to see why the questions would be asked publicly and within chelsea of you know can we do something differently? Can we perhaps shift to four three three, four two three one, something different? Um, and wh- I, I don't know. I think we we can only see what 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 Tuchel will do going forward. I think he's he's already shown a bit more flexibility in terms of you know, Pisi mentioned it earlier, playing Lukaku with Werner as more of a front two. It's still with the wing backs, but I quite like that look because it's more similar to what Lukaku had at Inter with Lautaro Martinez. I think. He, I, I've thought throughout that him and Timo Werner can play really well together as a combination. Um, so that could be something, or you could play one of the other forwards alongside him as well, like a Havertz or a Pulisic or something. Um, but in terms of shifting to a back four, I don't get the sense it's going to happen soon. If it's going to happen, it's something that would, would kind of happen with the aid of a transfer window. Um, so maybe we, we look forward to this summer and, and then we might get the definitive answer as to what Tuchel's thinking. Brilliant, brilliant. I mean, it's a lot of interesting insight today. I do very much apologise if we went a bit longer than we did agree up on earlier. Um, my bad, <laughs> Liam, or our bad, I guess. Um, but yeah, no, we massively appreciate you taking the time, of course. But I think we're going to wrap it up here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have enjoyed this video, I hope you did enjoy this video. But if you have, please do subscribe. If you haven't already, smash the like button. Of course, check out The Athletic and check out Liam. Um, obviously, all his work on The Athletic. And of course, check him out on Twitter as well. The link will be down in the description below. Pice, obviously, thank you for joining us. Thank you for making this happen as well. But yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys for watching. Up to Chelsea, up to numbers, and we'll see you next time.